Good morning, everybody. My name is Samantha Mirabal. I'm with MoCo's application team, and we're here today to do our design shop talk to see what questions you guys have to try to get them answered. Um, you can ask questions about design shop. If you have questions while we're live, go ahead and type them in on the comments. We're live on both Facebook and YouTube. So good morning, Brian. So be sure to type in your questions there, and I'll try to um, incorporate those as we go. Uh, if you see me looking off to the side, I've got another set of monitor, another monitor over here on my left where I can kind of keep track of what's going on on the different platforms. So I'll start off with the questions that were sent in ahead of time and we can go from there. Well, actually, let me make sure both platforms are up. So I see Facebook, Yeehaw, and I see YouTube. Good. So we're good to go. All right, can you adjust the underlay on lettering? For example, if it's an edge run and you want to have it slightly inset, absolutely. All right, so let's look at that. So underlay. So I have some text and I guess I don't need to do all this, but I'm going to. All right, uh, good morning, Lorena. Sunny Alaska, everywhere's sunny and pretty now. I like it. All right, so let's take a check. Let's look at this. So what we have here is I've got some lettering. You can see the underlay. It's got an edge walk and a zigzag. If I go into the properties of this, that's where I'm gonna be able to change that underlay and make adjustments to it. So how do I do that? So I can select the lettering first. To select it, you can click on it. You can click on it in your project view over here. You can click on it in the screen. You can double click to get to your properties. If you, um, you can right click and go to properties. It all takes you to the same place. All right, so once we get our properties up, now what? Well, let's go down to underlay. You'll see I have auto enabled right here, but if you wanna make changes to it, you're gonna to wanna to turn off that underlay and set your own. So let's say you wanna edge walk in a, um, edge walk in a zigzag, which is what's currently there. And right here, this is where your, these numbers here are how you're gonna adjust what that edge walk is doing. Okay, I tend to like absolute personally. So if I say a border margin of seven, just to give you a reference point, what does that mean? So the border margin is how, how close, how far, whatever you wanna think. How far inset from the edge of my lettering is that underlay, all right? The smaller this number, the closer this is gonna to get to the edge. So if I make this zero, it's gonna be lined up with the ed, with the exact top stitching. Is that something we wanna do? No. Uh, why? Because remember, embroidery is gonna shrink some. So you're gonna put that row of um, edge walk down and then you're gonna come back over and do your top stitching and it's not gonna line up and your edge walk is going to be hanging out in the breeze, which isn't a pretty look. So you can make it closer if you want. What is a good number? I don't know, seven points, seven to 10 points is nice and safe. And um, so I call that safe. Now there is a question, does it matter if you choose edge walk or zigzag as primary? Um, uh, probably not. I like to do the edge walk first and then the zig walk, zigzag second. Why is that? Because your zigzag is more like a satin stitch, right? That goes from side to side. And when you're moving from side to side, you're gonna be narrowing up your column, all right? So fabric's gonna start shifting. Whereas my edge walk is gonna be a line of stitches just in a straight row, tacking that fabric down to my stabilizer. So I personally prefer the edge walk first because it's gonna hold it down so that when I go do my zigzag and then my satin stitch on top, I've got that nice foundation holding it, preventing that motion as much as possible. So it, it's a personal preference, but um, I like the edge walk first, personally. Okay, um, you can change them, but uh, let's see. So if the, que the specific question was, you know, how do you make this less or more inset? You change absolute, the smaller the number, the closer it's gonna to get to the edge, the larger the number, the further in it's going to go. All right, and like I said, seven points, that's good and safe. Five is probably the closest I would recommend. Have I done closer? Yes, do I suggest it? No. Um, <laughs> So it really depends on your application, what material, what stabilizer, all that fun stuff. All right, what else about underlay? So 
Oh, percent. I didn't talk about that. So percent is math based. All right. So is multiplication based. This is just a straight number, right? So percentage is going to look at the distance from one side to the other, and it's going to have your edge walk fill 60% of that space. So you, that's all this number is doing. I just prefer absolute because I like to tell it where to go. So I like offset and I like absolute numbers because I can say exactly where I want it to be and I like that. Okay, so that was the first question we had. So how do we have it inset? So we did that. Um, this one, I really, I looked for the email and I did not see it. So if you can, I will, afterwards I'll look and see if I can find it so I can answer your specific question. I think Sophia asked this one. Um, when I went to the applications email and looked, I didn't see it. That doesn't mean it's not there. A lot of people use it. So I'll have to go back and ask around and see where we could find that. Because I don't have a file to be able to help you with. I'm sorry. Um, is there a way to make colors blend together like on Wilcom? So yes, we've got a lot of... Um, videos as well as re reference material on the FAQ site that you can look into for blending. Um, there's also a blog article on the Melco blog that Nate wrote that talks about, you know, how you choose the right colors and all the different considerations you do when blending. So that's also a really good resource for you. Um, so let's see, where is Design Shop? Here we go. What are we doing? Oh, blending. Sorry, I got distracted with the next question that just popped up. <laughs> All right, so blending, let's take a look. Um, a bunch of different ways to do blends, right? So I can draw, I gotta close this. This beta has an issue. The updated beta does not, and I didn't open that one. Ah, we did get you the link to the, um, to the blending resources so you have that all right so open there we go all right so I'm gonna draw me a rectangle just because it's easy there we go all right so I've got a rectangle it's just a fill so it's a really basic fill if I go into the properties right click go to properties I can come over to this effects tab and turn on custom density. Custom density is where you find your blending, okay? So if I turn that on by itself, what do you see? Well, it's the color I have here is hard to tell. Let's see, there you go. All right, so you can see there's more stitching down here, there's less up here. This is just one color, it's not an actual blend. To turn it into a blend, I would turn that one on, and if I give it an alternate color, now you'll see I've got two colors here, and I can adjust this accordingly to get a blend of what you're, whatever you're looking to do. So under your properties effects, this is where you change all of that, whether you want to flip it to make it go top to bottom rather than um, bottom to top. If you don't like exponential, you want to do, you know, a wave of sort where it's denser in the middle. Um, if you want to do just a straight line linear, you can always play with it, which my favorite thing to do is turn on auto apply add points to this and drag them around and I tend to make large motion so I can see what's changing and then I can dial in to what I'm the look I'm going for okay so yes you can absolutely do watercolor looks um, just a matter of either setting custom densities and then overlaying on making sure you're not making it bulletproof so you don't have really tight densities one on top of another um, for instance or you can use blending directly within here all right, so we do have a link to all the different resources and videos and sample files and blog articles, all that fun stuff for you to check out. Okay, uh, we have a question typed in on YouTube. Let's see, it says, when I do column one or two around something or curves, it seems like it flits on, flips on itself in some points. Okay, so the columns, so column one and column two, particularly with column one, you have to pay attention to what side you're working with. All right, so you're always going side one, side two, side for your points. So, and ne never going side one, side two, side two, side one, because that's gonna flip it. What do I mean by that? Let's try it. Let me go open some artwork so you can, so I have something to trace. 
You guys all have this too. So if you go to your C drive, maybe if my computer will cooperate with me. There we go. All right, so we're gonna go to, goodness, my C drive, designs, where's designs, there it is. Graphics, and I'm gonna open this column thing. And I'm gonna scale this down to, let's say three inches, so it's something a little more reasonable. All right, so what I mean for column, right here we have our column one. You go side one, side two, so all of this versus all of that, right? So as you're drawing it, before I start tracing, what I mean by that, your column one is always pairs of points. So not only are you forming the shape that you're doing, you're also doing the stitch direction lines. So if you kind of think of it that way, when you're doing your pairs of points, whether they're curves, you know, see, as I'm going around things, these are all my stitch direction lines. So if I turn it into 3D, you'll see I made a big old mess here with this curve, this line here, because all my stitches are there, and now I'm swinging them all the way to straight. All right. So it's always pairs of points, and I, you always go from one side to the other, back and forth, not crossing. And what I mean by not crossing is I went from the bottom to the top, so I want to stay bottom to top or inside to out, however you're looking at it. And I don't want to do this where I cross it because when you do it flip, you're going to flip it and create, you know, a bow tie, but that's not how we digitize bow ties. So let's not do it that way. All right. So that with the tool, that's what you have to pay attention to. So as you're tracing this, you, oops, backspace, you've got to pay attention to your pairs of points. Notice I can't go here because I still need a point there. So the column one, you really kind of have to be cognizant of both sides of the shape you're working with so that you can kind of work accordingly to always have your pair. And if you ever mess up like I just did there, you hit backspace. So you always have pairs of points that you're working through. See that? Right clicks are on the curves. So I did a right click on this curve, left click on the straight points down here. And I'm trying to keep all my lines relatively straight for my stitch directions because I want a nice little satin stitch and not something all cattywampus, right? Okay, I'm gonna stop after, oops, backspace because I wanna come over a little more, there we go. I guess I'm just gonna go to the end. I've committed this far, we might as well continue. <laughs> all right, so you'll see I'm always going from bottom to top. When you're done, I hit enter, and now I've got a satin stitch there. Okay, so what you'll always see as I went bottom to top the entire time, if you're going on a curve, it's gonna be you know inside to outside. You're always gonna stay from one side, side one, side two. That's how I tend to think about it, of wherever I started is side one, wherever I went to is side two, and I'm always bouncing one, two, one, two, one, two, with a column one. Now your column two, you trace one side of the shape and then you trace another side of the shape and add stitch direction lines, right? So if I take the same thing that I did here and I say, okay, let's do a column two. This is a little easier because I can just do straight points. I don't have to pay attention to both sides of the shape. So when you have organic shapes like this or things that are changing significantly from side to side, you know, it takes a little less effort of having to pay attention to both sides at once. So I start, you know, I trace side one and now I'm gonna go focus on side two after I hit enter once I got to the end. See that? And then all you have to do when you get to the end here is add your stitch direction lines. So left click and drag to add stitch direction lines. Okay, so it's just, which one are you gonna use? Okay, um, column two is kind of better in general for things that are very different on each side. I'll say, I, this is not a good reason. I have a strong affinity to using column one. Why? It's not a good reason, I'll tell you that right up front. You see all these little black arrows that show that these pop out if you hold them down? Yeah, when I started using Design Shop before I bothered to take any classes, I didn't realize any of these were pullouts, so, or, you know, had more options. So whatever was default here is all I used for a really long time. So 
Yeah, that, like I said, not a good reason, but that is why I have a strong affinity to using a column one. All right, let's see. How to make an S, a vector file into a nice embroidered file, but only two inches small. When decreasing the size of the motif, the lines are getting too thin. Um, what motif? Can I edit the vector lines in DS before converting to... So, yeah, you can edit them, but in general, it's rather than converting, when you're working with super small things, um, I'll say personally, I tend to just digitize it from scratch because then I can govern what I'm doing with it. So rather than just doing a flat convert on a vector, um, you would go to... Um, select each element and just do them individually. That way you can control what you're telling it to be. So if you, let me find an example. I don't think I have any good small ones on this computer, but I know you said, uh, Sophia, I think you said you sent an email. I looked beforehand. I don't know if someone got to it before I did because I couldn't find it. And I'm sorry, I, look, I looked before here. I'm gonna have to go dig some more. Um, yeah, I don't have any good small, Oh, that's probably the closest one. Oh, I don't want it in Illustrator. Ooh, sorry, I have Illustrator open. So let's go try this again. Let's open up that flower because it's got smaller things. So let's see. So for instance, this vector line. So yes, you can go change it some, but what you can always do is do them individually as conversions. So rather than just saying convert, I can come over to the change element from one type to another and tell it what to be. So if I want it to be a bean stitch or if I want it to be a single line center. So you have a little more control that way where you can, you know, dictate how it's going to stitch out. Um, the motifs, are you talking about like the, f like fill patterns? If you have an example you can post, that would be awesome because that might help me govern of what I'm trying to show you. When decreasing, the lines are getting too thin. How would I make them thicker? You would just change it. So like here, if I change this to a single line, I did, oh, how did I do that? Let me quick. So I selected my shape. I did shift, clicked on there. Here, as it gets smaller, I would just change the width of that. So that's not really as a vector. That's working with your um, actual sew out files. So. I guess it might be helpful if I know what kind of design you're looking at. Um, let's see, how can we change those defaults? Uh, Brian's asking. Um, I don't know that we can change what defaults show up here. Um, what I would suggest is just learning or setting your own little um, keyboard shortcut so that you can just quick type it on your keyboard and you can use that using the accelerator editor right there. So if you don't like the one that's assigned, which for a column two is control shift and the number six. If you don't like that, you can change it to be whatever you want. Okay. Hi, in Germany, welcome. I don't speak German, I'm sorry. But hi, let's see. What else do we have? Phil. How do I update from version 10 to version 11? So you would reach out to your salespeople. Um, you can, I think you can even email sales at melco.com and they can put, if you don't know who your salesperson is and they can put you in contact with someone. I believe that's the email. I'm sure someone not from Melco who's watching the comments will um, type in if I got that wrong. But um, you basically you'd reach out to your sales agent, let them know what you have if you're upgrading or if you want to buy outright whatever it is, and work with them to see what you can negotiate with them. All right, so I recently purchased a Amaya. Okay, so I don't know if that's gonna be the Big Red or more running OS version nine. I'm assuming that's gonna be our Big Red, but I guess it could be something else. But anyway, so you purchased a uh, running machine. Would it be beneficial to update the software? If you're talking about updating the design shop, yeah. I mean, um, you can always, it makes it more efficient, right? So with the new software, um, design shop software, there's a lot of kind of things that help improve processes that um, 
make it run nice and smooth and you can do new things. The primer stitch, it's just got more function, uh, more capabilities. So yeah, what it would be beneficial. Do you have to, if you've got a way to digitize and you have a machine that's running, no, you don't have to. Um, but yeah, I, I really like the new software, but, um, just cause some of the new features are just awesome. Uh, I accidentally deleted the foam arrow rectangle fill design from the design library. How do I get it back? Um, I don't know of any way to get it back short of reinstalling the software or getting someone to email you the file, um, that OFM file to drop back in the folder. So what I would suggest is, like I said, you can either reinstall the software, um, which will kind of refresh all the databases, um, or you can e email service at milka.com and ask them if they can send you the file. Um, but it's an OFM file, so they should be able to send you that, I assume, um, and to be able to drop back in the folder. But I don't, short of reinstalling, I don't know how to get that back. Okay. Let's see. How do you put the dimensions in for a hoop not in the list? All right, so I think there is a help file out that we can get you a link for on um, the Melco service site to show you how to do that, which he'll talk about creating new hoops. But when you create a hoop, well, first off, I did that again fast. Right here is where your hoops are. If you right click on that, that'll bring up your hoop manager. From here, I can say add a hoop, give it a name. I do a lot of goofy things where I set a name to something weird. And then you can set the size of it if you actually have the shape that you want it to be, you can go to edit hoop shape and then you can tell it what shape it is. If it's a custom shape, then you're got, you have to know all the points and all of that fun stuff. So there's, we did get you the link for adding hoops manually, but yeah, this is where you would do it. So you come over here, you know, set your dimensions, edit the hoop shape, the outer shape, all of that, and you'll be able to create whatever hoop it is you have. Now the hoop database has been updated um, and you can get that off of uh, the service site. So if you get a Melco service, uh, there's a hoop database that you can get pull off of there to update them to the latest hoops that are all in there. So if all you're doing is you've got a really old database, you can get the new one um, that has a lot more hoops in it. So that is an option too, rather than creating your own. But that's how you do it, right click, go and um, create a new one, add a hoop, type in whatever shape you want, follow the instructions in that manual adding hoop and you'll be good to go. But you do have to know the shape and all the dimensions of it to be able to set it up right. So just keep that in mind. All right, and we did get you the link for that. All right, I purchased a hat Hoop, a hoop tech, bleh, the hat hoop tech, and I don't seem to be able to add it to the sewing field in the Maya XTS. So depending on which database you have, it might actually be called the Dream Frame um, rather than the Gen 2. So when you go into your hoop, right click on that guy, go to customize list, look through your list. If you've got an older database, rather than it being called the, let's see, it's in here, like the Gen 2 or the back, these are the hoop tech ones. Um, there's another one down further, but they're the same names. It might actually be called Dream Frame. So that's what you would look for. Or update the database and then it'll show up as a Gen 2. All right, but that's where you would find them. So under Customized Hoop List and then scroll through the list of hoops looking for them. And it'll either be the Gen 2 on there, right there or dream frame maybe oh we got a new one ah adding the gen 2 frame all right so they have a link uh we have a link there for you all right i'm using flex os and touching up a design it won't start where i want no matter what so general what i think I'll tell you what I think you're doing and then I'll explain what's happening. So I think what you're saying is, hey, I'm trying to move a design around. You know, it's already been sewing out and now I want to move it somewhere else until it to start, but it's going back to other points. All right. So that's 
it, particularly with the new software, that's by design. You can move the hoop around, it'll go back to the previous location unless you override that with the command sequence on the keypad. And that command sequence is this one right here, retain X, Y position. You have to hit the up and down key. So there are a ton of things we can do with our keypad, but to let's, if you're in the middle of sewing, so the design isn't done and you move the design and you want it to stay where you put it, you have to hit that up and down button to lock it in to say, stay there. Don't go back to where you were. Okay. So that's, what it will do to stay where you put it rather than going back to where it thinks it should sew. Okay. And we did get you a link to all the keypad functions. There's a ton of them. Um, I copied these straight out of that, off that um, FAQ that we're posting for you, but there's a lot, but that's it right there. Retain X, Y position. Okay. And as you can see, there's a ton of different ways. So you can, this is one, if you haven't used this one, you should. Let's see, where is it? Bypass trim required. That one's a good one to know just in general. Um, like if you have a thread break and you wanna send the grabber back, but it says trim required, well, you can bypass that trim by hitting the adjust key in the hoop. So the adjustment key and the hoop. Okay. All right, let's see. Do we have other ones that were typed in? I don't see any, so I'm gonna pop back to my little PowerPoint. Okay. Ah, I know there's a rope one and row two in decorative. Those are filled. I need a rope that is just an outline. How do I do that? All right, so let's see. File, open. I made a file earlier. So let me go find it. Of course, I did stuff after I made it, so it's not in my history. There we go. All right, we have another question typed in. I have an XTS in OS 10 Design Shop 9. What's the largest magnetic hoop I can use, and does it require the extended arms? Um, well, an XTS you can use whatever the largest is that the um, EMT 16X can use, and I think that the monster magnet hoop does require the large arms, if I'm not mistaken. But you can use any of the same, the XTS can use the same hoops that the EMTX can use, 16X. So we'll look at that in a sec. All right, so creating rope designs that are filled, that are outlines rather than, um, an outline rather than filled. So the rope that we're talking about that was asked is this decorative, if you go down, as to the type, you can tell it to be rope one, which is smaller than rope two. And you'll see that gives you a satin type rope. Okay, so I drew uh, not a very pretty one. It looks better this way. I, this one I'd wanna adjust, but I drew one just so you could get an idea of it. So I took this little link and when you're creating your own decoratives, what you need to pay attention to is your start and stop. All right, so a decorative, where it starts is where the, when the next repeat is going to start when this one ends, right? So I drew the shape I thought might look good as that little one, one single rope. And how did I do that? I did a walk stitch there, a bean stitch, and then a bean stitch over. So the top of this rope actually has four pieces of thread. The bottom only has three. Um, you know, it's plus or minus one, it'll be all right. So that's just how I did it. I did it in three pieces. So I started here, and by the time I was done, I ended right there, all on the same line. All right, so again, you did do that here using your walk, and I did a normal, paying attention to where it starts and stops, did a walk, and then did a bean stitch, and then another bean stitch, which was just a copy and paste of that walk and change the type. Okay, so once you have the shape you think might work, what do you do with it? Well, I selected the whole thing, so select it all, right click, save custom shape, and you'll see I always overwrite this test file until I'm happy with it. So type in test, decorative, okay, yes, overwrite that. And then I look at it and see, do I like what happened um, or not? So I'm gonna go do a walk, decorative, change it to test, 
and take a look at it and see is that the look you like do you want to change it tweak it um, if I'm being critical I probably want to adjust this top little point a little bit uh, just so it's laying down a little bit more but it's not bad kind of like it but I probably tweak this one just a little bit so how would we do that well again I just come and move points around and try it so move that one and remember that was two so I either copy and paste and change it again or move them both and try it again right click save custom shape test yep decorative test yeah I like that better there's less of a gap right there okay that was tiny little change but I like it better so it's the did I need to do that no it's just a personal preference okay so that's all you would do for it um, is you know decide what shape how did I get the shape to begin with I'll be honest this is what I did I grab I went down to the let's see design nope decorative stitches I went over to rope one right here I dragged it up there and I used that as a starting point grabbed this roughly traced it as my starting point and now then after I have oh that's cute we'll make that normal there we go I traced it and then used that as my starting point to then get rid of that turn on my grid and make sure my start and stop and all of that are all on the same line which is the important thing with decoratives so when creating this guy my start and stop all have to be on the same plane otherwise you're gonna get shifts in the design and weird little jumps okay make sure no one from Elko is messaging me nope all right yeah so there you go that creates a little decorative rope design all right so those were the questions I had a, ahead of time um, back to the, the magnetic hoop I would have to go honestly I would go to the um, magnetic hoop website go to or to I think they're also on shop Malco, but and look at which ones are the at what widths they are and just get the largest one that fits if you don't want to get the extended arms you know what's the biggest you can fit in the standard hoop and then if you want the extended arms I think you can get that big um, the really big magnetic one that fits in there I don't remember the actual numbers on it I have to go look it up all right what other questions do we have all right let's see um i do not see any other questions being typed in yet so i guess i will call it i'm gonna quick scroll through and make sure i didn't miss any ah cool they did get you a link to the mighty hoops um on shop melco so that'll help you see which ones are compatible okay well I don't have any other questions and I don't see any others coming in so I will call it a day I think and we will be back next week I hope these are helpful for you um, be back next week see what we can trouble we can get into what questions we can get answered um, remember to type them in if you type them in on you'll see this kind of cover sheet this this image pop up in some of the Facebook groups um, and that's where I go looking for questions ahead of time so when you see that if you type them in there I'll be sure to include them you can always email um, Sophia like I said I didn't see the email I'm gonna go dig through and see if I can find it afterwards um, so what see if I can help you privately on that one 
because I'm not 100% sure. All right. Well, you have a fantastic weekend, and I will be back next week. I think next week. I don't know. It'll be Thursday or Friday. I'll post about the day before, so that'll give you a heads up. Um, husband's in the hospital, so that's a little bit hectic at the moment. All right, guys. Have fun, and I will talk to you next week. Happy sewing. Bye, y'all.